you know, as an 18-year-old, I may be able to make $200 for having sex with someone. As a 13-year-old or a 12-year-old, I can probably double that. And I've had numbers, can't even count how many kids tell me that, you know, the demand side asks for younger from them. So they're 13 and they say, you know, hey, if you have a little sister, I can babysit for half an hour, I'll give you $1,000. The biggest risk of being trafficked in Canada is just being a girl. Any girl, anytime, anywhere. Most people, even now, um, think that it's a foreign problem and they don't realize that it is a Canadian problem and it's happening here in every backyard, in every community right across this country. I can tell you that we've learned from law enforcement and frontline service providers that if you ventured maybe a kilometer and a half, maybe two kilometers from here, you could find victims in hotel rooms. I was totally unaware uh, of the, that human trafficking even existed in Canada um, or in Toronto. And it just strikes me, it always strikes me as ironic when I stand here on the 29th floor and I know that within a block, two blocks, three blocks max, there are victims sitting in hotels, brand name hotels. And it's just wrong. We know from law enforcement um, that, there, that there is trafficking and coercion um, and luring going on in high schools malls, in large department stores, where there are these predators trolling for kids. We know that there are predators who are coming into our children's bedrooms on their social media. Um, they have access directly to these kids via their electronic devices and they are luring them as well with promises of a really good life, with promises of gifts, with promises of fun, and with promises of love. Cyber sex trafficking is the live streaming sexual abuse of children that's viewed over the internet. So in a typical situation, um, a what's typically called a customer, I call them a predator, um, located anywhere in the world, including here in Canada, and we'll talk about that, um, can wire a payment easily and anonymously, um, something as small as $20 up to, we've seen up to about $200 Canadian. Um, and they wire that amount of money to the trafficker. And then they, the customer, are able to actually direct um, a live sex show. And that's the exploitation um, of Filipino children on the other side of the screen. So we have had um, cases involving very young children. In general, our children are very young in this casework, but we've had children as young as two who have been victims, um, and in rare cases, even younger. So Canadians, we are part of this demand. Um, in a uh, study by cybertip.ca, if you guys are familiar with them, um, they are Canada's tip line for reporting online sexual abuse of children. And so one of the things that they found through their research is that Canada ranks in the top three for 60 countries for hosting websites with child sexual abuse images, for hosting the images themselves, and also for selling material on child sexual abuse websites. It is not per capita. So our small, relatively small size as a country, that's not per capita. That's just overall. So we rank in the top three for each of those areas. It, I've talked to many, and, but then they're, they come from poverty, and they, they want stuff too. And 
there's no time to go to school because you got to look after some of your own siblings, your parents. So you have to have fast, big money, right? And, uh, you know, they, they just get stuck in that and then they end up disappearing. Never, many of them never to be seen again. I work at Red River College and I'm very privileged to be able to sit with our students that come. And what I'm seeing makes my heart very sad. They have definitely identity crisis in our community. They, I always ask the question, how many of you know anything about your culture? There might be two hands go up out of 25 students that have come from the reserves. So the damage that was done you know, by that uh, residential school and colonization. We are seeing it in our communities now. When I sat on that task force, uh, the trafficking task force, the thing that really, really hurt me, hurt my heart so much, because the, when all the survey that was done at the end of it all, they said the majority of the children are being trafficked are Indigenous here in Canada. So that was a huge blow to my, to my spirit for sure. Uh, because I, I, I and, and so I, I say, well, why is that happening? Because you have broken parents, you see. The parents who have that, the, 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 um, uh, the uh, residue of residential school and colonization that broke the spirit of our, our, of our people. There are so many systemic issues that the Indigenous community are facing, systemic discrimination, racism, um, historical abuse and trauma, um, lack of access, I think, to education and opportunities, um, addictions, mental health issues. All of these are compounded issues, um, one on top of the other, that I think really makes women vulnerable. The stats are there. I mean, it's, there's no arguing. Uh, it, in Canada, the, the, the young women and older women as well, who, who are most subject to human trafficking, are in fact Indigenous. Um, and, and, you know, you, you link that with missing and murdered Aboriginal women, and you can, you know, like one, it, it's, it's just one big. Uh, very complicated uh, issue. You cannot compartmentalize this and say, well, these are the people that are being trafficked for, for the sex trade, these are the people that are missing, these are the people who are murdered. It's all, it's all part of a very ugly and tragic scene right in our own country. There are the traffickers who are luring and grooming these girls and then forcing them to work in the sex industry or in the labor industry, predominantly in Canada. Those are the two forms of human trafficking. But then there's also the purchasers or the buyers um, of these young girls and women. So when you look at that area, it's a business and it's a profitable business. We've been told that this is a very high profit, low risk crime. I never hear any talk about the perpetrators. Why are we not speaking about the perpetrators? I said, I imagine that most of them are men. And my thought is that um, if there were no perpetrators, we would not be losing children. So why are we not speaking very strongly about the perpetrators? I've gone into schools and seen presentations for girls in grade 10, 11, and 12, and it's an auditorium full of young women, and I don't see auditoriums full of young men. Um, so we really focus this issue on survivors and victims of trafficking, and there's 50% of that equation, which we often don't discuss. And that is who is buying these women and girls and who is selling them, and I think, um, we need to spend more time talking about that. We need to talk to our boys about that. I think that if the churches can do anything at all, because if I'm not, I'm not mistaken, I think when I say that men are the leaders of most churches around the world, right? 
Okay, now that's a good example of what's happening here. So if they were to do anything at all to save the earth and save the children, they should be a big movement. There should be a big movement of voices speaking the truth and saying, brothers, fathers, uncles, grandfathers, stop abusing children. Stop having sex with children. And that's the kind of a voice we need to hear with the men. So as a grandparent and, and as a, a baptized person, <laughs> as a bishop in our church, um, you know, why would I be concerned about this? Well, I love my granddaughter. I, I also made a vow in my baptism that I would respect the dignity of every human being. And, and, uh, and so why would the church be involved in that? Why would the church not be involved in it? it it's, it's, it's of the essence of one of the commitments that we make in baptism, to respect the dignity of every human being. And human trafficking is an assault on the dignity, on the beauty of people and the image in which God has created them. As a group, you're stronger than as an individual. And to be able to actually share that with a policymaker who may be part of the congregation or not um, is very, very important as well. Um, being heard and having a collective voice is so important. You can't get anywhere if you're stuck in your guilt. You'll, the church will never get anywhere if they get stuck in their guilt. You gotta do something. No human being should ever be bought and sold. Um, it is not only a national crime, it's a national human rights abuse that happens in this country and it should not happen anywhere in this world.